order the meeting of the Finance Committee on May 28th, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. First item of business is the, is the approval of minutes. I need a motion on the draft minutes of the May 14th, 2024 Finance Committee meeting. I move approval. Moved by Alder Wheeler. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on to item three, public appearances for non-agenda items. I don't see anyone in chambers. We got one agenda item. Uh, okay, moving on to item four, four finance director report. Thank you. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind the last couple of weeks. So we have lots of things in the agenda for you um, under finance director's report, and I'll start there if that's okay. Uh, so first is the TID 15, uh, which is the former town of Madison TID 2 that came over to us when we absorbed a portion of the town. Uh, so that. TID was closed last year with the affordable housing extension, which we are collecting currently. And then this is that final audit that we're required to do along with the reporting that needs to be submitted to the Department of Revenue. So as of now, this TID is completely closed. I did wire out to all of the overlying jurisdictions their share of the uh, excess tax increment that was collected, which is on page 10 of the audit, page 18 of the total packet. Um, so it was a total of 173000 that was available, uh, that was excess increment collected, and then it's all allocated based on the proportionate share of the tax bill. So the city's portion was about 59000 And so those wires are done. Everything is, is taken care of for that, Ted. I'll pause for questions. Yes, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me how this works. We, we had... A, uh, excess increment we had to return, but then we're also keeping it open for a year for the affordable housing. So do you have to, like, what, why, why did we do that rather than saying, okay, it was closed at this point and everything from here on is for the affordable housing fund? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so under the statutes, you can only keep it open for one year. So that's mm -hmm. the money that we are collecting now in 2024 um, that's going to the affordable housing fund. This audit is as of the end of 2023, which is kind of the closure piece of it. And so we could have chosen not to do the affordable housing fund, and it would have looked just like this, but without that housing money. Um, but as a policy decision, the council decided to keep it open that extra year. Okay, so the, like, there's particular dates when it has to close, like... And, and then after it's closed, that's when the affordable housing t clock starts ticking. Close. So the council passes an affordable housing extension resolution, which keeps it open for that extra year. Mm -hmm. And then you file or do another resolution to actually officially terminate the district. But because of how the calendar fell, that's where the tax roll timing came into play. So I don't remember the magic date, Greg, since you're here, my phone a friend. What's the magic date for when it goes to next year's roll? Isn't it May something? I don't know. No, April, <laughs> so, April 15th April 15th. is the deadline to close the TID district. Thank you. Um, so because we did the extension and the termination all ap after May 15th, that's why it's this roll now that we're collecting for the affordable housing fund. Okay. I'm not entirely sure I fully understand why there's, you know, the excess refunded to the overlying rather than saying, oh, the clock started a little earlier and, and nobody gets a refund and the, and the affordable housing time period is it started a little earlier and is going to end a little earlier. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, so it's based on one full year of tax increment. Okay. So that one full year of tax answer? increment still went to the affordable housing fund, okay. which is kind of just right off the top, and it has to be exactly that dollar amount. It's not like we could say this extra money can also go to affordable housing. Well, I'm not saying it's also. Just... I'm saying instead of. So, you know, one, so there must have been a cutoff when we said that the district is closed as of this date. And we had this excess increment rather than saying, oh, no, it really closed two weeks earlier. And so there was no excess increment. And that's when the one year period would have started. Sure. So the excess increment is a, a point in time. So every time we send out tax bills, that's when the increment is calculated. So it's not like it's based on payments of people coming in. It's based on years. Okay. So it is, it's, it's because of the calendar. Correct. Okay. Other questions on the... The termination audit. Misty? Excellent. Other things that are in your packet is the 2023 annual reports for all of the TID districts. So this is a relatively new requirement. We have to file with the Department of Revenue on the status of all of our TIDs. 
Uh, we will be presenting these to the Joint Review Board on Thursday. So if you do have questions, that might be a good meeting to um, tune into. Greg will be back on Thursday for that Joint Review Board meeting. Um, but wanted to at least share them with all of you here. And then they're also out on the city's website. So for all of them, we have to file the form with the DOR. For four of them, we also did the supplemental report that Greg helps us with that kind of looks forward and projects out the TID. So all of that information is in the packet for your information. Other than that, uh, the CIP is also uh, nearing completion, working with the mayor on the final edits. That goes out to the public on next week, Friday. And then budget worksheets also go out next week, Friday, assuming the schedule is approved tonight. So gearing up for that process to kick off. That's all I have. Wonderful. Moving on to the review of bills. 5A, detailed review of checks for $10,000 and above, May 1st to the 15th, 2024, totaling $339,036.56. $339, Questions? Since Tim is on the um, call here, what are Terminator chains? You're muted, Tim. Sorry, where where specifically is that? That's on page eighty three, or eighty three. Yeah, of the of the agenda. That is not Tim. That is Fire Department. So Chief Grossman may oh. be able to share. <laughs> what is a Terminator chain from KB Sharpening Service? Oh. It's for his chainsaws. There we go. Okay, there it is. Thanks. It's Okay. I just thought I just thought that was an interesting name. <laughs> Terminator chain. <laughs> All right. Good to know. Anything else? Next five B. Detailed review of all checks issued, checks 126878 to 126942, May 1st to the 15th, 2024, totaling $483,647.77. Questions? Moving on to 5C, detailed review of P-card transactions for $10,000 and above for the cycle ending April 8th, 2024, totaling $84,537. Questions? Moving on to 5D, review of P-card transactions for the cycle ending April 8th, 2024, total $208,450.39. Any questions? I got a couple. Bill. Um, I saw Zoho in there. What, so we've got um, you know, Office 365. What do we use Zoho for? Could you share which page you're on? Um, it is on page 108 which is 18 of 24 okay so that's in the IT department I'm not sure but I can find out okay and one more um, I lost probably a good eight to ten minutes of my life trying to figure out what is lafc.org and you go to the website, it says this domain is for sale. I'm like, what is this? And so I copied and pasted it, and it turns out that the L was an I. <laughs> can, can we have a, like a serif font for, for some of this stuff in our agenda packet, do we think? I don't know who's in charge of that. So my team is the one that puts this report together, where you can change the font if you would prefer okay. something different. So the only downside is the city's official font is Arial. So that's why it is in Arial. Okay. So we'd have to talk to economic development. I don't know that I could go off brand, but. The capital I and the lowercase l are nearly indistinguishable. I understand. Although I did see that you, you capitalized the first W and the O in org, so I suppose that was my clue. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so you'll see the capitalization is off a little bit in all of this. That's because from a, a cost-benefit analysis perspective, we use formulas just to do proper titling, and staff doesn't go in and rekey all of the things to make sure that it's the right title case. So we assumed it wasn't a priority to be okay. perfect and use it at least as close as we could get it. Other questions? All right, we can move on. Next six action items, 6A, 2023 audit presentation by Baker Tilly. Do you want to kick us off, Misty? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is the 2023 audit has been filed. I shared it with the entire council as required under ordinance. Uh, but then also the auditors are here to discuss the results with all of you kind of as the official audit committee, uh, which is one of the finance committee's role. So I will turn it over to Andrea Jansen, who's the partner at Baker Tilly, who does our external audit for us. Thanks, Misty, and good evening. Thanks for your time to discuss the 2023 audit reports tonight. Um, for our time together, I do have some um, planned remarks that I'll go through, and we'll spend the bulk of our time looking at some summarized um, financial statement highlights for the year. And then I think it might be easiest to just tackle any questions that the group has um, at the end, if that works. So I will share my screen. And are you able to see that? We can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so I want to start with the city's financial statements. And just as a reminder, um, the city does participate in the GFOA award program for excellence in financial reporting. Um, so the report that um, you all see includes additional information above what I would call kind of the baseline requirements for a standard set of financial statements. And that's really designed to provide some additional context and clarity for um, financial statement users. Um, so the city did receive uh, the Certificate of Achievement um, for the 2022 report, and you can see that's included in the 2023 financial statement. Um, they'll be submitting for the 2023 report as well. Um, really, what you're after when you have an independent auditor looking at your financial statements is the independent auditor's report or the opinion. Um, we were able to issue an unmodified opinion again this year that's otherwise known as a clean opinion um, on these financial statements. And that is the highest level of assurance that we're able to, to give. Going to move from here to the other formal audit report that we issue, which is the reporting and insights from the 2023 um, audit. And this report includes a lot of different required communications. If you haven't spent a lot of time with this report in the past, um, I would encourage you to, to review it. It does explain certain audit responsibilities and concepts. Um, we do cover internal control matters in this report, um, which are on page six of the report. Um, I'm pleased to uh, report that we did not identify any material weaknesses in internal control um, during the course of our audit, which also means that we did not identify any material journal entries um, as part of the work that we do. Um, I think this should give you a lot of confidence in the information that you receive from the city's finance department. Uh, other comments and recommendations, we do include this decentralized cash collection point, um, not because we identified any issues, but just uh, more of a reminder that any anytime you've got decentralized cash collection points, that does have a different um, level of risk for the city. Um, other items included in this report, um, there is a link to our website for other um, topics that might be of interest to you um, besides just the, the financial statements and the audit. Um, your client service team is included. So if there are matters that come up during the year that you have questions at or on or things that you think we should be aware of, please do feel free to reach out to anyone of us on the audit team. And the last section of this report um, is a two-way audit communication uh, designed really to get you thinking about the 2024 audit. Um, again, if there are any matters that you think we should be aware of, um, thinking ahead to next year, please do feel free to reach out. 
So I will now move to um, the 2023 financial highlights, which is a report that we pulled together really for purposes of this meeting to look at some of the uh, metrics that we think are kind of key to um, the operations of the city and things that uh, you should you should know about. So we'll start here with page one, um, your general fund results. Um, as a reminder, your general fund is the primary operating fund of the city. And when we talk about fund balance, um, that's the equity in the fund. So in high level terms, what's left over when you take your assets minus your liabilities. Um, at the top of this chart, we're comparing 2023 um, ending fund balance in total to 2022. So we've got about an increase of about 2.4 million over the prior year. Um, and then I'm gonna actually jump down to the bottom of this chart uh, the non-spendable fund balance uh, a little bit down from last year. This is just as it sounds, it's it's fund balance that's not in spendable form. Um, so the, the two largest items in that category are advances to your TIF funds, the money that's tied up in those, and then prepaid items. Moving up the chart, your restricted fund balance, really similar to last year, that is uh, restricted for park projects. Your assigned fund balance uh, of about 9.2 roughly um, million dollars at the end of the year. If you want to see details of that, you could find that on page 43 of the financial statements. Um, but that is largely made up of carryovers, um, designations for the 2024 budget, employee retirement balances. Um, assigned fund balance, I should mention, is is fund balance that you've earmarked for specific purposes. Um, those earmarks can be um, undone uh, so should you decide to use those funds for a different purpose. And that leaves you with about $6.7 million in unassigned fund balance, which is fund balance that hasn't been earmarked for a specific purpose. We will look at that a little closer on the next page. Before I get there, um, wanted to share the summarized income statement for the general fund for the year. Um, this is a very high summary, um, high level summary. If you wanted to see the detail of what makes this up, you would look at the financial statements um, page, starting on page 55. Um, actually, the middle column here, your final budget, you can see that the city planned for just under a $1.6 million loss for 2023. And so your actual results were a net income of about $2.4 million. Um, obviously, a very positive swing there. Um, the variances on the revenue side, largely made up of investment income. And then on the expenditure side, um, there were some savings, uh, mainly in the general government and public safety categories. Before we move off of that chart, can we ask a couple questions about it? Sure. Um, in regards to the the net change in fund balance, what was the, why was there almost $4 million of difference between what we um, anticipated and what actually happened? Do you want me to take that one, Andrea? If you want to, that, that may be helpful. Sure. So in the final budget column, we are planning to spend, I think that's 1.6 million of fund balance. Um, that was the intentional spend down of fund balance as approved in the budget. Uh, and also included carryovers, because that is the amended budget, not the adopted budget. So it would include anything that was carried over from 22 into 23 um, is what we expected to spend. And then the difference, if you look at the actual versus the final budget, so the revenue variance is the 1.1 million, top right corner. Uh, that is mostly the investment income that Andrea mentioned. We had almost a million dollars more in interest revenue than what we budgeted for, because the market is really high right now. Um, but at the same time, we don't want a budget for it to be that high because then when it inevitably drops, we will have a big hole that we need to fill. Um, so we do budget reasonable there and not at that high level. And then on the expenditure side, you can see expenditures were $2.9 million less than what was authorized in the final budget. Uh, the bulk of that is going to be the carryovers from 2023 into 2024, which was a little over a million dollars. And then we also had some pretty significant staff vacancies in the mm -hmm. police department, the new positions that were authorized that weren't hired as of the first of the year. There were some vacancies there too. So that's the bulk of what that difference is. Great. The other question I have is about the restricted money. 
uh, in that chart, and so that that was identified as the park fees. Is that that old? Okay, it's not park fees. Okay, it's a uh, money held at the Madison Community Foundation for the splash pad. So for Great. for a park, but it's not the park fees that I think you're thinking of. Great, thank you. Thanks, Misty. Um, so I'm going to move on to page two of this. Um, we are still talking about the general fund, still talking about fund balance, but we're taking another look, a closer look at that unassigned fund balance piece, um, which is the, the money that you have not earmarked for any specific purpose. Um, we've got a few different lines here on this chart. Um, your policy minimum is in this light blue. Your policy maximum is um, this black line. And then we've got the purple line with um, indicated as a Moody's target. So we're looking at a ratio of your un assigned general fund fund balance compared to your revenues. Um, you can see, you know, over the last few years, this percentage has gone up above the range. Um, we are we are down back at about 25.1 percent um, at the end of 2023, which is slightly slightly above your policy um, maximum. Um, but really, we've included some. Um, median reference um, comparative metrics in here on these blue dots. Um, so I would say a very, very healthy unassigned fund balance um, right at your policy range and in line with some of those other um, communities of similar size. Um, so really no concerns with where you've landed. Um, this is a very healthy number. On the next page here, we are going to switch gears and talk about um, debt, your general obligation debt. So on this chart, we've got a few different trend lines going here. The, the top black line is your um, general obligation debt limit. That's the state statutory limit, which is 5% of your equalized value. Um, the city has a slightly more restrictive um, policy limit, which is mapped out on the blue line here, and then your actual general obligation debt outstanding is the red line at the bottom. Um, so, you know, very positive to see your debt limit trending upwards, um, and then your actual debt outstanding of about $56 million at the end of the year is down slightly um, in actual dollars compared to last year, and then down as a percentage of your debt limit. So, you're at 20% of your state statutory debt limit at the end of the year. And I believe this calculates out to about 33% of your policy limit. Um, also note that the utility funds do not have any debt. Um, other communities may have other types of debt besides general obligation debt. A lot of times we'll see utility funds with revenue debt. Um, so that's something that we're not seeing here for the city. Um, if you're into data and looking at other comparisons, this link will take you to the Wisconsin Policy Forum, which has um, all the, a tool um, that you can compare with all different municipalities across the state. So we are still looking at that, that when we're talking about um, this next ratio, but we're looking at what you're spending on debt. So um, we've got your debt service to non-capital expenditures mapped out as a ratio here in the red line of about 15.2% at the end of 2023. Um, we've got, again, some comparative metrics for municipalities of a similar size, um, slightly below um, most of those comparative metrics and slightly down from last year. Um, there is a note to the schedule, kind of these fluctuations that you're seeing are the result of um, some refunding debt and some TID call debt. So that is why you're seeing those uh, fluctuate. Um, if you were to map out sort of the adjusted figures, it would be a pretty stable uh, metric over the last five years. We're going to move in then the last three slides that I've got here. Um, are taking a look at this, the utility funds, starting with your water utility. Um, as a reminder, the rate, the rate of return um, is governed by and set by the PSC of Wisconsin for the water utility. So you can see your actual rate of return um, compared to your authorized rate of return 
and then we've got your operating results mapped out here. Um, revenues above operating expenses for the year, which is a good sign. And then we also take a look at your uh, cash unrestricted cash reserves at the end of the year of about 4.9 million, um, slightly down from last year, but a very healthy cash reserve. And again, no debt for this fund. I should I should also mention on this one um, that the city or the water utility does have new rates in effect um, for 2024. So I would expect this top line, which is very flat compared to 2022, um, to have a, an increase as we head into 2024. Next up is the sewer utility. Um, this fund historically has trended, you know, very closely together operating revenues versus operating expenses. Uh, this year was about a $35,000 net income. Uh, so again, pretty close to break even. You've got about nine months of unrestricted cash reserves, which is a, a healthy balance and that has been building over the last five years. Um, so that that all looks good. Um, I would just say continue to monitor, you know, this fund with, with such a close um, break even. Um, that is something we just want to keep an eye on. And then lastly, stormwater utility results. Um, similar story for this fund, about an $86,000 net income this year. Uh, the last two years have been trending positively with net income in each of those um, years compared to a net loss in the, the previous three years before that. Um, healthy cash reserves. Of about 816,000 at year end, it's about five months of operations, and that is down slightly from the year before. So, again, just a, a fund that I would continue to monitor. Um, but again, with all three of these utility funds not having any debt, um, certainly there would be room to borrow uh, should you need to do that. So before I open it up for questions, I just want to make sure to say thank you to Misty and her team um, for their preparation for the audit. Um, they really do a fantastic job, and that makes our jobs all a lot easier. So um, certainly appreciate their their help and their their preparation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea. Misty, anything to add? Nope, nothing for me. Questions from the committee? Bill. Um, yeah, so the utility funds, um, you know, they a couple of them track, you know, basically identical between revenue and expenses. The water fund seems to be um, making a little more money. Um, do we have guidelines in place for what those fund balances ought to be? And do we have, like, you know, things in the CIP that, our upcoming expenses that we're planning on using these funds on. Would you like me to take that one? Yeah, please. So uh, utilities, are, we look at them a little bit differently than, say, the governmental funds. Um, so for utilities, the metric that we use so more is that unrestricted reserves that's listed at the bottom of the chart. We do not have a policy for those at this point. Um, Though I will say it has been ebbing and flowing, especially on the water utility and the stormwater side with staff vacancies and projects that are delayed. Um, so sometimes that will will change. So it's something that we look at, but it's it's not the same formal policy as what we have for the general fund. And then with the sewer fund, you know, Andrea mentioned that the lines are right next to each other. So it's a very slim margin there. Um, but we feel comfortable with that because the bulk of those charges paid out of the sewer utility is a pass through from MMSD. And at the beginning of every year, though, there's an ordinance that allows us to update our rates to mirror whatever MMSD is passing on to us. So the it's it is a slim margin, but it's also very low risk. So we feel comfortable with that. Anything else? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We'll recommend to the council that they, they check that out. Thanks for your work, Baker Tilly. Always a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much. We can move on to action item 6B. Uh, I'd like a motion on resolution R8124, approving purchase of 2019 case 590 SN tractor backhoe. I'll move approval. Motion by Alder Jetzer 
and I'll throw it to Tim. Thank you. Uh, Public Works Streets has budgeted $155,250 for the replacement of the 1997 Caterpillar backhole. Public Works Streets located a quality used 2019 Case 590SN for a cost of $92,000 from Brooks Tractor Supply or Inc. in uh, Sun Prairie. The price of $92,000 from Brooks Tractor includes four new tires installed. Brooks Tractor has estimated the value of the existing 1997 Caterpillar 426 at $20,000. Uh, $20,000 would be used as a reserve price to auction the 1997 Caterpillar 426 at Wisconsin Surplus. So we're looking for approval of the purchase of the 2019 Case 590SN from Brooks Tractor and authorizes $92,000 for this purchase. And then we're also looking for authorization for Public Works Streets to auction the 1997 Caterpillar 426 at Wisconsin Surplus with a reserve price of 20000 If the reserve is not met, um, we're looking for authorization to trade the Caterpillar 426 into Brooks Tractor for $20,000. Great. Questions from the committee? Thank you so much for saving us a good good amount of money from what was budgeted. Nice work. Uh, seeing no questions, we can go ahead and take a vote. All in favor of resolution R8124, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on to action item 6C, resolution, I'd like a motion on resolution R8724, approval of lease agreement and replacement of current postage meter with new IMI compliant meter per USPS regulations. I move approval. Motion by Alder Wheeler. I'll take this one. Uh, so there was some changes required at the USPS, or the United States Postal Service, uh, which is requiring us to get a new postage meter. Uh, so the proposal in front of you is to get an updated unit, uh, which would meet those new requirements. It does cost a little bit more, so there's a budget amendment relatively small associated with this, uh, but the intention is we would be able to break the old lease with Pitney Bowes and then sign this new five-year lease um, with them going forward. Questions, Bill? Um, yeah, so th there's verbiage in there that says $502.92 for the remainder of 2024, but didn't it also say that that was the quarterly cost? And we've got half a year ahead of us? So the budget amendment that's included, that's the difference between the new postage meter and the old postage meter for just the time frame where we expect to go up to the up other one. It may just so happen that it also equals a quarterly amount. I'm not sure. Um, but that's just the differential. Seeing no more questions, we can go ahead and take a vote. All in favor of resolution R8124, say aye. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. I take that back. Oh, we already voted on that one. Um, all in favor of resolution R8724, yes. say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item, 6D. I'd like a motion on resolution R9224, approving the creation of the Community Equity Ad Hoc Committee. I move approval. Moved by Alder Jetzer. Is Ms. Deegan Kind of take it. So Great. there was a bit of a discussion at Department Head this morning about what Finance Committee's role is in this resolution because there's no cost associated with it. But it's highly unlikely that there would not be any referral to a resolution. And so I think by default, it ended up here at Finance. Um, so I don't have anything else to add to it other than what's in the packet. Any questions? Nothing finance related. I'm just wondering what the schedule is, how many meetings per year and when they would, I mean, is that a monthly thing, quarterly? I don't know if anybody knows. <laughs> I do not know, but I bet at council they will. Okay. Yeah, my guess is the mayor will cover at council. Yeah. If there's nothing else, go ahead and take a vote. All in favor of resolution R9224, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item, 6E, Resolution R9424, adopting the 2025 Annual City Budget Schedule. I move approval. Motion by Alder Wheeler. Can I, Misty? Yes, so included in the packet is the proposed schedule for the 2025 budget adoption. Uh, if this is approved tonight, uh, worksheets would go out end of next week, and then we would go through the process with the mayor. The budget would be released in... 
sorry, September, and then we'd have the October Committee of the Whole meeting with adoption in November. Um, so included here are all of the dates. At the bottom of the first page, there's a couple of small-ish differences between last year's schedule and this proposed schedule. And then there's also those budget process guidelines on the top of the second page. The one I'd like to draw your attention to is the one that's in red font that talks about the impact of the referendum. And I know we've talked about this a couple of different times, but essentially we would put together the mayor's proposed budget as though the referendum was not approved. If the referendum is ultimately approved, we would do an omnibus amendment to add all of those items into the budget. And also just for our new member highlighting the October 1st and 2nd special finance meetings where we do presentations. From the, from the different department heads. Always a really good way to see what's happening in the city in the past and what's coming in the future. Questions, comments? Bill. So we'll do the, the normal amendment process in addition to, I guess, the council as a whole will decide on what goes in the omnibus? Not exactly. So the omnibus is a finance director amendment. So it's a correction amendment. So those are only things that are, are corrections. And so the referendum components will be decided upon by the council in advance. But what's in the omnibus amendment will be exactly what was included in the referendum. The council amendment process, as though the referendum is kind of off the table and not discussed, that will be the same as what it was last year. Seeing nothing else, we can take a vote. All in favor of resolution R9424, say aye. 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 Motion carries. 6F, resolution R9524, awarding fire department engine purchase contract to Reliant Fire Apparatus, Inc. Chad, are you going to kick this off? Need a motion first, please. Oh, yes. I'll move approval. Mo moved by Alder Jetzer. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> so... Um, Back in front of you, regarding uh, to the purchase of the fire engine through Reliant Fire Apparatus, um, <clears throat> after it was approved um, and going off to 100% prepayment, we received uh, a payment agreement through Reliant Fire Apparatus that consisted of eight pages. Those eight pages were not part of uh, the council packet um, when you had a chance to look at it the first time. Um, we did discuss uh, the cost of 100% prepayment over the base option as far as uh, purchasing it, which you um, had passed 100% prepayment at that time. Um, so based off of that, we received that prepayment agreement, or I'm, I'm sorry, the, the purchase agreement through Reliant Fire Apparatus. In there, there are a couple exemptions that may cause may cause an increase in the cost of the apparatus while we wait 50 to 53 months. So we thought it was very important to make sure that you have those eight pages to review, hence why I'm back in front of you tonight after you've had a chance to review those eight pages. Thank you, doing our due diligence. Any questions? Bill? Uh, could you give us a high level summary of those eight pages? <laughs> Like, okay, so we're going to do the prepayment, but they may have, we may incur additional charges beyond that. Right, so there, there's, there's a, uh, hopefully I had a chance to review it, but in there, un under the purchase agreement, there's a couple conditions. Number seven, it's called the producer price index. Um, this index, I, I know uh, Misty would be much better explaining what P the PPI uh, is for, but... The only time I guess that this has really been enacted was during COVID, um, which that increase went above the uh, 5% um, for the PPI. Um, so that, that is a possible increase um, from what we would pay, would have paid for the 100% prepay option or even, even the base price option if we would have went that way. And then uh, the number 13, the force majeure, um, there's a couple conditions there. If there's a change in the price of the chassis that it increases, then that increase would be passed on to the buyer. And then um, there was uh, one other one, um, the component price volatility. So once again, if a price increase is enacted by suppliers of major components, once again, they would pass that on to the buyer. So 
like I said, because these eight pages weren't in that initial uh, packet, we wanted to make sure that you had a chance to review this document um, with those conditions. Great. Do we know when we will pay this? Like, is it, I know we're, we're authorizing the payment, but at what point will we actually make the payment? Yep, so with the 100% prepayment, um, let me get down to that right page here. So the prepayment amount, uh, the 100% prepayment amount um, would be at the time of contract signing and execution. Which I assume is very soon. Once, once it's signed, then yes, then we'd, then we'd go through um, making sure that we work with finance and making sure that gets processed appropriately. Great. Bill? Um, okay, so the, the verbiage in here said we're not quite sure what the benefit is of prepaying, but there's still a benefit, right? Because if, if we were to pay later, then what we thought we were going to pay today is really higher anyway, right? So um, there's about a 16% um, uh, savings on doing 100% prepay, but like you said, over that course of 50 to 53 months, you're right, there's, that's, the, that's the question mark. And I know Misty can definitely uh, include her thoughts on that too when it comes to the 100% prepay versus the, the base option. But by, by staying with 100% prepay, it, we still stay in budget with the pre with uh, with this um, resolution with the new resolution I'm sorry yeah so just to highlight what chief Grossman was saying so the the prepayment option does does get the money out the door faster and it is then within budget we don't need to do a budget amendment but whether we prepay or we don't prepay we're subject to the same cost escalations so when we brought this to you the first time we said the big benefit of prepaying is you lock in that price Turns out that wasn't a true statement, which is why we're coming back to you. So that real benefit is no longer there for the prepayment. I'd say now we're kind of wishy-washy on should we prepay or should we not, um, but we liked the fact that it was now within budget um, and it was the, the same proposal as what we brought the last time. So if we put away the 970 k today in some investment vehicle that's got, you know, like a CD or something, would we be able to grow that to more than the 1.158 million over the next four and a half or five years? I think that's the big question mark. So right now, <laughs> interest rate's really high. I don't know how long that's going to last, and the CDs that we're investing in at that higher rate are only three years. Um, it's not the full time. Um, so yes, we're losing out on the interest revenue, but we're getting the 16% discount. So there's kind of that give and take. And then, yes, the vehicle probably won't be here for, was it four and a half years to five years? Maybe it'll come in earlier. And so then, you know, there's less risk there. So it's, we, we, I don't necessarily have strong feelings either way as far as if we should or should not prepay. I think it's, it's kind of a crapshoot. But because we had already said in the debt issue and stuff that we were going to borrow for this project, um, which there's flexibility there, but we kind of said that already. You already authorized the prepayment. It does make it within budget. We felt that that kind of barely tipped the scales to still do prepayment. If we do end up having to pay an additional cost at a later date, how does that work, like, financially? So, um, actually, under number seven, under the PPI, if if... This project was to increase due to PPI. We actually, if you lead, read the last sentence, they would notify us, and we have the option of then simply, you know, not moving or proceed, be allowed to proceed with with uh, the purchase. The problem is that leaves us without a piece of apparatus that we've been like, say, if this happens in three years, and we say we don't want to move forward with it anymore, we're still out an apparatus. Piece yeah. of apparatus um, with a five-year lead time. On correct. <laughs> exactly. Um, but presumably, we'd have time to budget for it yeah, and so, add it in. So procedurally, what would happen is uh, the fire department would be notice notified of this increased cost. They would do a change order to the pre-approval, which would come through council, and then have a budget amendment associated with it. Right. So any change, even from from the manufacturer, would would have a. a um, change order attached to it and then brought forward to the council. That anything make that, that there's changes would be a change order. But, you know, like I said, 
even under the the number the 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 seven and thirteen conditions in the purchase agreement. The only time the PPIs really went in effect was during COVID, when when we had a pandemic, and then thirteen. Um, the one example that um, our manufacturer, I'm sorry, our salesperson gave was um, there was a needed change to fire apparatus uh, where the hose that's carried on the engine. Um, before, I never used to have to have any type of door or netting to keep the hose in hose beds. Um, there was a situation, a, a very um, fatal situation, where a hose had come off of a responding fire engine and hit a little girl and killed her years ago, which then caused the, the um, industry to put netting and or doors and, on those cross lays. So in the 20 years that our salesperson that's been doing this said the only time we've had to increase um, under the force majeure was when they had to put the netting, which was $400 per vehicle at the time that was being built. Um, but like once again, this is we wanted to make sure that you had the information, the statement that it's locked in. Yes, if nothing happens, it's locked in. But there's these ifs, and it's a long time from now to... 53 to 54 months that something could happen. So we wanted to make sure that you had all the information that we received in those eight pages. Yeah. I wonder if there's a way to capture that once we are able to assess four or five years down the line if this was a good call, which I think it probably is going to be. It'd be good to capture that somehow so we know for future purchases. Although I know we don't purchase fire engines that frequently. Any other questions? Um, yeah, the wording on that uh, PPI is is kind of it's a, it's a little confusing. So it says if if costs have increased at a compound annual growth rate of five percent or more, then we'll be charged for the increase over and above five percent, not the full amount. Is that right? Am I reading that correctly? I guess that's my understanding. But okay, so it it softens the blow somewhat. And then. Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, this is language that's required by Pierce. So if we want to purchase a Pierce truck, uh, this is the terms that they right. are requiring us to have. Okay. Right. Um, I'm not aware of the other manufacturer's terms at all. Ready to vote? All in favor of Resolution R 9524, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, moving on, item 6G, resolution R9724, accepting an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Fitchburg and Dane County to analyze the feasibility of the teen center. And move approval. Moved by Alder Wheeler. Deanna, are you going to cover this? I am. Good Wonderful. evening, everyone. Uh, this is an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Fitchburg and Dane County. This has long been planned and actually uh, Dane County has this um, potential intergovernmental agreement in their budget for 2024. And what the intergovernmental agreement will do is allow Dane County to fund one half of the teen center feasibility study. Um, we currently have a contract um, council approved last December for the phase two of the teen, teen Center Feasibility Study. Um, we're finally getting all our, our pieces in place to put the intergovernmental agreement in place that will allow one half of all of our contract costs to be paid by Dane County. So. That's fantastic. Misty? If, if I may, I'd like to add one other detail. So included in the resolution oh, is a clause. Oh, do you want to do it, Deanna? No, no. no. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, there is a clause included in there that if the intergovernmental agreement is modified to just increase the amount that the county is providing or supporting the project, that staff can approve that administratively rather than having to come back through council just to try to streamline that process if they're willing to, to help fund more. Bill? Um, so the, the change order for $33,000, this is... Can you explain where that comes from, why that exists? 
So I certainly can. That is the next item on your um, agenda this evening. And <clears throat> in order to oh, uh, complete the study, uh, the uh, the EQ team, our, our consultant, is requesting some additional funds um, to actually do all of the required pieces and parts. Um, so with this change order, once again, one half of, eventually one half of that change order will be paid by uh, Dane County. Any other questions? All in favor of resolution R9724, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on, item 6H, resolution R9824, approving change order number one for the Verona Road West Neighborhood Teen Services and Resources Feasibility Studies Phase 2. I'll move approval. Moved by Alder Jetzer. I know we just got a little bit of a summary, but anything you want to add, Deanna, about the change order? Uh, no, um, I did. I had had some expectation that there would be a change order. Um, the team has um, expanded their work with some of the teens um, and um, to, to adequately flesh out um, the con concepts, uh, they're requesting the additional funds. And when we budgeted for this, did we know that the county money was com coming? Or was that a new... Unexpected. When, uh, that's a good question. Uh, no, when we originally budgeted for the fifty thousand, um, the the county funds, the county um, budget was passed afterwards. Great. So our contribution with the fifty percent share is it still within that fifty thousand dollar budget? It should be. Yes. It sounds like so. It should be like forty four. That total yeah. study is going to be less than a hundred thousand. So. Great. Yes. Any other questions? Bill? I'm curious. The uh, GL department that's listed is 5144, sustainability. So let's just... Yeah, uh, um, actually... <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Deanna. Uh, so uh, it's sustainability and, and healthy neighborhoods. It's just uh, a matter of what fits in the screen. Okay. <laughs> Seeing no more questions, uh, all in favor of resolution R9824 say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item, 6I, resolution R9924 approving revised building program for the police services facility. I move approval. And we have a public comment. I think probably we can start with that. Ari Lowe is here to speak in opposition of the item. And you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Ari, and I'm a resident of Fitchburg near the Leopold neighborhood. I also have a certi certificate from UW-Madison in criminal justice. While the city promised to pay for a new police facility, we should not agree to pay more than $35 million that we already pledged for it. $35 million should be all-inclusive, and since this building will be an energy hog and open 24-7, 365, solar panels should be included. The proposal that includes any green features costs $39.5 million. And even without any green features, the current proposal is $20,000 over budget. Some of my reasons for recommending we keep costs to $35 million include, the proposed facility will further current rifts between residents from our priority neighborhoods and the police department. Historically, we've seen that funding police facilities increases arrests. And the way this project has been publicly presented as an all or nothing proposal is problematic. Spending this amount of money on a police facility is not helpful towards <laughs> healing any community relationships with the police department. As a woman at the information session on uh, Jan February 8th, 2024, at Leopold Elementary School, eloquently put it, we given y'all this money to build a building so y'all won't have to work in y'all's cars. At least you all have a car to work in. Some people don't have a house to live in or a car to sleep in. See YouTube video at time 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 20 seconds. I also find it problematic that during a public presentation about this new building, when I asked what a building would look like if the city spent only $35 million on it, the police chief told me that I am defunding the police. See public information session 
uh, November 27th, 2023 at 45 minutes. This is unhelpful rhetoric meant to shut down a discussion and politicize a civil discourse on budgeting. Finally, U.S. history shows that when you put money into the police, you see a boom in incarcerations, especially for black people. This is a particular problem in Fitchburg because WIBRS data confirms that although Fitchburg's population has a racial split of 65% white people and 13% black people, arrests are made of 42% white and 54% black Fitchburgians. These problems will not be solved by constructing a beautiful building for the police department. These problems will also not be solved by better training for police officers, since we are all fish in water with the systemic racism in our society. We promised the police department that we would fund their building up to $35 million, and that's important to honor our promises. But expanding the project's budget is not going to help heal our community. History agrees that it's a bad use of funds, and the public discussions so far have been aimed to shut down alternate opinions instead of hearing them. Instead of bolstering our systems that punish and incarcerate our citizens, let's bolster housing security projects, food security programs, preschools, and after-school programs that support empathy and root cause analyses. Let's right, keep that's... this project, including renewable energy options, to $35 million. I'm sure the police can find a way to remove $20,000 from the proposal at the absolute least. All right, that's time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, does the staff want to introduce this item? Or, I mean, I, I might suggest that given the importance of this conversation, we might refer this to council without a recommendation. But just a suggestion. Chad, do you want to introduce? Good evening, everyone. So uh, the design staff, including uh, city engineering, uh, FGM Architects, Pepper Construction, the Police Department, and City Administration have been uh, working since uh, the meeting back in February in which the uh, previously presented uh, programmatic and schematic design uh, were not approved by Common Council. Uh, the group has been working diligently to identify what could be done with $35 million dollars and ultimately what you have in front of us is programmatic design that reflects uh, a number of reductions and cuts from uh, what was originally presented uh, to have a, a facility that's approximately 52,000 square feet, uh, which is approximately, I think, 25 to 30,000 uh, square foot reduction from what had previously been presented to the Common Council. Uh, notable uh, reduction, I'm sorry, notable cuts from this particular programmatic design. Uh, include uh, all of the training components that had previously been included, including uh, the uh, community room as well as um, the community slash training room, as well as the uh, training scenario bay, uh, which uh, had been proposed to have live fire capability or at least be set up for that. Those items have all been removed from the programmatic design that you have in front of you this evening. Uh, the challenge that uh, has been uh, presented here, as you can all imagine, our uh, costs are not decreasing. Um, they continue to increase, and we're trying to strike the appropriate balance of how to best utilize the uh, funding that's been provided with uh, creating a workspace that will uh, address the needs of not only the police department but city hall uh, staffing uh, issues or space needs issues. Uh, for the longest extent possible based upon uh, the $35 million that is uh, currently allocated for the project. Uh, in consultation with Pepper and FGM, obviously uh, there is a uh, strong desire to put uh, sustainability improvements in the, the project. Uh, those uh, uh, costs, uh, of course, are not insignificant. Uh, we are hoping to be able to capture some of the uh, federal uh, money that is available for sustainability improvements uh, through direct pay and other uh, avenues, which would ultimately reduce the cost of those sustainability improvements uh, at some point after the building uh, is constructed. Comments, yeah, Jim? Question. So, Chad, at the current square footage, how long would this um, building last due to the fact that Fitchburg is one of the fastest growing cities in 
um, Dane County or Wisconsin right now. And with that, I mean, either we're going to cut services or we're going to increase um, personnel. So at our current rate right now, how long will it last? I think it depends on the area. What the design team's hope is, is that the more expensive areas of the building and those that would be harder to add on to in the future I would be sized uh, more appropriately to last 10 to 20 years. Uh, thinking of things like the uh, parking area underneath the building, uh, the evidence uh, storage and processing area, those sorts of things that would be again difficult or, or more challenging to add on in the future. Uh, are going to ideally be a sized a bit larger than uh, other areas that may not last as long. Uh, the office areas and other sorts of work areas are sized down a bit uh, with the thought process that in an ideal world this building can ultimately be designed that could be added on to in the future uh, and more appropriately uh, added on to via the office space um, that might be a bit easier to add on to uh, in the future at a, a more reasonable cost than some of those other items. So that's a, a fairly lengthy answer uh, or lack of answer, to be honest with you, because I don't know. I mean, I just don't know how fast the city's gonna continue to grow. I don't know what public safety staffing looks like in the future. Um, what we're, again, trying to do is put a project in front of the Common Council that does the very best we can to meet the budgetary constraints of, of uh, you know the financial realities. Uh, but also doesn't have city staff coming back to the Common Council in, say, five or six years to say, we're out of space. We need to do another project. So what we're projecting, the additional officers that we're projecting to get, this building will accommodate that, plus some? Some areas will have capability of adding staff, yes, but not as much staff as been previously uh, identified. For instance, if I recall correctly, you don't know, have have the uh, I should probably pull up the actual uh, programmatic design. I think uh, one of the areas where there was a reduction is in the number of uh, workspaces that a sergeant uh, would have assigned to them. I think it was originally designed for twelve. It's now designed for nine. There are currently nine sergeants in the department, if I recall correctly. So that would be an area where there's is it eight or nine. So that would be an area, for instance, that was previously, you know, probably could have gotten 15 to 20 years, uh, is now likely to get either it's going to be full when we move in or one more position could be added in that particular role um, before they would be uh, capped out at space. So if you work your way through the... the um, Supporting documents, there are charts and tables in there that highlight some of the the uh, reductions and cuts, not some, they highlight all of them, and can identify uh, where you may have seen you know significant reductions to, to get down to the 52,000 square feet. Yeah, keep going, yeah. And when we say it was it's space for nine sergeants, are those individual offices or are those desks? So under the previous design, those were, uh, I believe, shared workspaces or, you know, individual workspaces within a shared area, uh, not necessarily individual offices. Now, it's important to, to uh, differentiate what was presented the last time was a programmatic and schematic design, which had a basic floor plan of the building and exterior mm -hmm. renderings. At this point in time, there has been no schematic design uh, uh, done on the building. Uh, largely because of the costs that would be associated with drawing up another schematic design. And if, uh, if this particular programmatic design is not, uh, is not approved by council, we didn't feel it would be a prudent use of the taxpayer dollars that are already being provided to already pr be presenting a, a second schematic design, uh, recognizing uh, the feedback that's been received so far. So if uh, council approves this, uh, tonight then we would move on to schematic design and uh, then the basic floor plan of the building would be put together as well as um, the exterior renderings and if i recall correctly again we'll have um, uh, representatives from fgm here this evening for the common council meeting uh, but in the previous design i believe you saw a two-story design and i think this one is is likely to be a one-story design uh, as well to help with um, 
uh, cost reduction, uh, eliminating obviously a portion of elevator waste, I shouldn't say, underutilized space and stairwells, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, does also provide for an, uh, a different roof line uh, that could be potentially utilized that would maybe allow for additional solar array uh, panels to be placed on the roof uh, versus previous the previous design. So there's still a lot more work to do on this? Oh, definitely. Yeah, this is really, you know, we're back uh, more or less to, to square one here with, with the pro programmatic design and then uh, schematic design would be step two. So uh, we're really uh, asking for uh, Common Council's approval of the programmatic design that will give uh, the design team the direction that's needed to, to move on to the next step. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? I have a lot of questions, but I I would prefer to have that conversation. I mean, those are those are great, really interesting. Mm -hmm. But I guess I would prefer to have the conversation with the entire council. Um, you want me to make a motion to refer it? If, if you yeah, if you're if you're amenable to that, yeah. I'll move to refer it because I have a bunch more questions too. Yeah. Um, all right, we have a motion to, motion on the table to refer to council without a recommendation from finance. Any questions on that? Nope. All in favor, say aye. 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 Mo uh, motion, motion carried. Next item, 6J, Resolution R-10224, authorizing the issuance and sale of $9,030,000 of general obligation promissory notes, Series 2024A, and this is a direct referral. I'll move approval of R-10224. Moved by Alder Jetzer. I've got a representative from Ellers here to, t to tell us about this. Good evening. I'll go through a summary of the sale results for the 2024A promissory notes that were sold this morning. Uh, we received a total of six bids on the notes. Uh, the winning bid was submitted by FHN Financial Capital Markets out of Memphis, Tennessee. The final true interest cost came in at 3.9633%. The total net principal and interest over the 20-year life of the notes is 12735000 $733, which is $1,224,000 less than our pre-sale estimate. So interest rates came in more favorable uh, than what we had estimated. We're also able to downsize the issue based on the final cost of issuance expenses. Uh, so the final amount that you will be authorizing is $8,790,000. So it's less than what you're, uh, you have on the agenda, but that's not a problem. Uh, you can always borrow less than what was authorized. I'll briefly go through the financial analysis that was included with our pre-sale report. We have included our bid tabulation, which shows the bids that were submitted by all of the underwriters. Uh, so you'll see on the bid tab, again, the winning bid was FHN Financial Capital Markets. Uh, the coupon rate, that's the interest rate that the city will pay over the life of the notes. The reoffering yield is what is being reoffered to the investors. Uh, the difference between the interest rate and the reoffering yield is what's used to calculate what's called a premium. That premium was used to help downsize the issue and also help pay interest expense on the notes, which I'll summarize in a moment. So you'll see with the underwriters, uh, good interest from around the country, um, underwriters from Wisconsin, New York, Minnesota, and Texas, and again, the winning bid was out of Tennessee. We've included the same uh, project list that was included in our pre-sale report. This also models out future debt issuance based on the capital improvement plan, which will be updated uh, over the course of the next month. But the projects included in these notes include 9.1 million for police facility improvements and 900,000 for fire engine acquisition. Uh, the resolution also gives you flexibility to spend any of those proceeds on road improvements as needed as well. Um, so we again have modeled out future debt issuance just for planning purposes. So the sources and uses, the final amount that you are borrowing is the $8,790,000, which is $240,000 less than what was authorized. Um, a premium bid was submitted, which means that the underwriter was agreeing to pay the city more than the face value of the notes. A portion of that premium is used to pay the underwriter's discount, and the balance is deposited into the debt service fund, which will be used to pay interest expense on these notes. 
So in terms of the amortization schedule, the facility improvements were amortized over 20 years. Uh, the fire truck improvement was amortized over 10. Uh, so you'll see again over the 20 year life of the notes, the net principal and interest is approximately $12,735,000, about $1,224,000 less uh, than what we had estimated, and that premium will be applied to help pay interest expense in 2024 and partially in 2025. As we've done uh, historically, when the city authorizes debt, we also show debt issuance over a multi-year planning period. Uh, so this chart includes the uh, future debt issuance for illustration purposes for 2025 through 2032 capital projects in addition to the notes that you're authorizing this evening. So the debt service levy from the 2024 budget to the 2025 budget is projected to increase by about $228,400. If you finance all the projects that are currently identified in the CIP from 2025 through 2032, you'd see a similar increase in the debt service levy annually each of those years. So the debt has been structured to kind of achieve a consistent levy impact year over year for debt service to make budgetary planning a little, a little easier going forward. And then in terms of the city's general obligation borrowing authority, uh, with these notes and some projected growth in your equalized value from 2023 to 2024, the city started this fiscal year, the end of fiscal year 23, at 20% of its statutory debt limit. You're projected with these notes to still be at 20% by the end of 2024, uh, remaining legal borrowing capacity of $244 million. So the city has more than ample borrowing capacity for all the capital projects identified in the CIP. And last, but certainly not least, as I'm sure most of you have heard, the excellent news from last week, uh, which is that Moody's Investor Services upgraded the city from AA1 to a AAA rating. The city of Fitchburg is now one of five communities in the state of Wisconsin that have attained uh, the AAA rating. It's a tremendous uh, accomplishment. I have the privilege of sitting through a lot of rating discussions, and I want to say with all sincerity that the presentation that city staff does here in Fitchburg is in a class of its own, uh, truly exceptional. I want to commend Chad, Misty, Mike, Joyce, all the staff that have a hand in putting that presentation together. It really puts a excellent overview together of all the city's financial strengths, all the economic development occurring in the city. Uh, this year we brought up the Moody's representatives uh, to go on a tour, uh, which clearly paid dividends because they could see everything they've been hearing about for the past several years. So I want to congrat congratulate staff, all the members of the Common Council uh, for achieving that rating. It's, it's truly an incredible accomplishment and certainly is going to pay dividends not only in your debt issuance this year, but in future debt issues as well. Uh, just for this issuance, we estimated in conversations with the winning underwriter, uh, the AAA rating probably saved about 15 basis points, uh, which is one basis point is 0.01%. Conservatively, that lowered the city's debt service cost by approximately $100,000. Um, so it'll pay dividends going forward. So it's a, it's a great uh, accomplishment for the city. Uh, so with that, uh, the resolution, again, just a reminder, the final borrowing amount is less, uh, $8,790,000. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Congratulations. Really, really exciting news and really lovely news to hear that we're $1.2 under what was projected for the overall cost. Any questions from the committee? Jim? Bill? Can I make one clarification for yes, the minutes? Please, uh, just so Alder Jetzer, you're the one that approved, motion to approve this resolution. I assume it was with this corrected dollar amount as recommended by Ellers, the $8 million yes. 790. Excellent. Yeah, we'll take that as a friendly amendment. Wonderful. Well, with no questions, I'll go ahead and ask for um, all in favor of resolution R10224, authorizing the issuance and sale of $8,790,000 general obligation promissory note series 2024A, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next announcements. Our next finance meeting is June 11th, 2024. Any other announcements? I actually won't be here for that meeting, so Robert will be here to cover for me. Great. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, I'll, t I'll t entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned at 6.44 p.m. Thanks. <laughs>